Now to the penultimate session of the <coughs> conference. And we switch from the Serbo Croatian morning up until the Western European or German or Berlin based uh, afternoon. Uh, two speakers, Kenneth uh, Southwell and uh, Vera Toma. Both of them, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Vera, you also engage with the post media anymore. Oh, no, no so, I, I was engaged with the yeah, same right. university yeah, until yeah, end of yeah. April. Actually, with Clemens, we have the situation of a person who is uh, talking yesterday about the media left of the, the 90s and the early 2000s. Yeah. Also, a member of the, of the, let's say, the beacon of the hopes of a digital Europe, at least the critical di digital Europe, attached to the post media left at Winnipeg or Fana University. So let's say uh, now becoming the hegemonic uh, institution in this in this in this domain. Uh, Prince was also a member of see, the, the uh, public countries in, in Vienna. He's been then engaged in, in the Austrian and German initiatives and, and institutions. And he will begin with this talking through the games of tactical media. Afterwards then uh, Vera will give a talk on the China and Internet. And, uh, so you were engaged with some of the Lunenburg University, but again, actually, you have also been engaged with the, with the, with the Institute of Network Cultures and the Video Vortex Conferences. So also, last year, you were, I guess, the first time in, in Zagreb. Uh, thank also, you. Thank, thank you. <laughs> so, the, the, uh, also, a prolific writer for, for many journals, also, then about the digital arts. Uh, yeah, so please pick it up. Thanks, Peter. Mm. Actually, I would also like to start, I mean, first of all, we thought about maybe to put the two um, presentations together, because I think what I will hint at this kind of post-media paradigm, which I will call it a little bit later, hints, I think, quite good in what Vera actually illustrates a little bit more on the kind of digital uh, digital cultures in, in China. And either we can take it together, but anytime if there's something like I'm missing or completely or telling completely bullshit, you just interrupt me and we can also take short questions. But I think yesterday was quite fruitful to have them together in some way because I'm not showing so much examples in some way. And I guess Vera's presentation is there much more um, into, the, into the details and, and illustrations. Um, as everybody started with some kind of autobiographical note, especially yesterday, I thought, I, why not? I do the same. Thing. Um, originally, I'm from Salzburg, and I normally hide this kind of fact because it's kind of you know terrible to be in this kind of like smaller part of Munich in some way. And as you can imagine, when I fled Salzburg and came to Vienna, it was actually at the end of '99, beginning 2000, and that was like the political momentum in Austria in some way. As you can already see, it was this kind of the right-wing government that came to power. And for me, this was like amazing. I mean, it was like a, a one-year street party, more or less. And this was also the time for me that I got more and more into, um, or slowly more and more into contact with um, this institution called Public Netbase, which was like on the one side organizing a lot of things on the street, down the streets, but also hosted a lot of like the anti-governmental initiatives um, on the service. And yeah, this is more my background in, in this kind of things. I became more and more interested then. So I joined them more or less in 2003. And, you know, there was this Nike ground thing and different kind of projects. And again, it was not tactical media in, in, the, in, in this kind of moment anymore. But I was got more and more interested in these ideas about tactical media. And that's also what I'm writing my PhD now at Humboldt University in Berlin, actually, which is about this kind of idea about um, these net cultures of the 90s in some ways an experimental playground for maybe what we have as everyday media practices, cultures nowadays. So it's this kind of tracing it as a genealogy. And that's also what I'm trying to do today is um, that the lecture is actually um, separated in two parts. So the first one is like tactical media and like recuperating it a little bit. And I guess at least half of you or more will hate me because you know all these facts, but sometimes it's good to recall them in, in, in some ways. 
And but what I would try to do is then to to see how actually this kind of tactical media movement, and this was also in the in the call for the conference, how this transformed into something which I would call or we would call also as a as a post media paradigm, and actually that it's not like a rupture in between, but it's really like a transformation. So the post media um, term actually, or the the idea about the post media. Age was actually coined by Felix Cattari, of course, that was like at the end of the 80s, beginning 90s. And what he saw, there was a, a transformation of classical media structures towards new collective, what he always calls assemblages of enunciation. That sounds a little bit like abstract, but I hope it's, it, it will not get too abstract afterwards. Um, I think also at the same time, there's this kind of thing when in media theory, this process or this transformation to post-media um, um, to a post-media paradigm was also accompanied, accompanied by some kind of a dialectical movement. So first in the, in the 1980s, postmodern media theories um, chattonized Marx's critique of ideology and abandoned in some way all hope of an emancipatory use of media technologies. So the best example is here, of course, Baudrillard in many ways, but you also have the German side with Kittler or Boltz. And then, actually, in the 90s, the tactical media movement rejected, again, this kind of quietist um, standpoint of more academic media theory in order to reinvent new forms of media activism. And that's what I call this, this kind of like double disengagement, ultimately opened up new fields of counter-hegemonic agency, and thus also enabling a, 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 a variety of radical media practices. And so I think also there's this assumption or like, like the idea that also the, tr the transition from tactical media to post media should, as I said before, should not be considered as a rupture, but rather something that you could call a, a media becoming. I think you always see this with like new technologies that actually hit the cultural field. And in the beginning, you have this kind of test fields, so like for the internet, I would say that was the 90s, but you can also see it with radio in the 30s or 20s. And then it becomes more and more into invisible, but also more becoming uh, more and more um, part part of the everyday. So I would say that the tactical media, tactical media itself is maybe not considered anymore, it's not visible anymore as a movement as it was maybe in the 90s, but I do think that a lot of the practice we are using now anyway in our everyday, like remixing and any different kind of things we are doing there, is quite tactical in many ways. So it didn't disappear, it actually just like became so massively successive that we don't see it as a movement or as a specific um, singularity anymore. Um, nonetheless, in some way, and that's also the thing about always, is that I guess in this kind of like dot-com crash, there was something happened which, which one could call like a historical amnesia maybe, that actually also the whole um, history behind these net cultures got um, lost in many ways. So maybe that's also just a pretext for me and my PhD and so on, that I can say, okay, and I have to do this now in some way. But I find it quite interesting that if we talk about, you know, media platforms, Web 2.0 and so on, that it's always as if, as if um, especially like, of course, not here, but in mainstream media, as if we have to reinvent the whole thing again. And there's none of these kind of discussions that already happened in the 90s, may it be privacy, may it be the, the question of infrastructures and so on. And you had this kind of debates and discussions in the 90s. And I think it's quite interesting to go back a little bit and to dig um, this out in some way. So the first part about tactical media, I mean, you know the definition, it's, it was a new form of media activism and artistic practices that, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, spread across Europe. And I say Europe because I'm more concentrated into European fields than Let's say as I, 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 I like stick to the European thing because that's the one I know and that I know that there are many different other fields, especially in Northern America, but I make the point afterwards it's a very crude definition and so on. And of course India and so on, there was also, it's nowadays since like five years you have tactical media, but this is like the, the field I'm like investigating a little bit more. And in Europe, I would say in particular, it was also this exchange between um, East, South, uh, Southeastern and Western Europe, which was like the the, more, the most interesting part in the whole thing, especially for public net base and as um, Soren and Branka know. Um, so on the one side there was this mailing list um, from Riga that was exchanged, but then it was also syndicated as a mailing list where many things happened. And also what's in net base um, initiated together um, with then at that time not CUDA or not yet CUDA, was also the period after. And I guess what's also interesting, what also Gerald like mentioned a little bit, that also NetBase, of course, like um, 
profited a lot of this exchange. So I think it was not this kind of thing what we told yesterday about only colonizing the thing, but like NetQuiz actually developed their practices much, much further, going then also into something like World Information Org and so on. And I think that was very fruitful, this kind of like exchange at that time. Um, and of course, in this way of the, of the early and mid 90s, there was also this new generation of internet activism, uh, activists that encountered, let's say, an older generation of radio and video activists. And there, that led to a kind of a shift in the definition of media activism itself. And that happens mainly, or mainly, but there was a big birthplace of this tactical media at this conference series of um, next five minutes. And in the kind of environment of the next five minutes, you had, of course, the, this kind of um, so-called manifesto, but then it's not a manifesto, of course, but it's like one of the most prominent texts, which was called the ABC of Tactical Media by Gert Loving and David Gar uh, Garcia, which actually I didn't know that Gert was also part of the Axin, uh, Axin like where he's still like an editorial board in some way. And out of that, you can see like the quote, what, um, what they called or define as tactical media, they said like, tactical media are what happens when the cheap do-it-yourself media made possible by the revolution in consumer electronics and expanded forms of distribution are exploited by groups and individuals who feel aggrieved by or excluded from the wider culture. Tactical media do not just report events as they are never impartial, they always participate. And it is this that more than anything separates them from mainstream media. So it's also about this kind of participatory uh, turn in some way. And the idea about participation, one has to be very critical about it, as Joanna also mentioned. But there was, of course, this kind of idea to be engaged into this kind of political struggles. So in Europe, especially those places where lively scene of pirate TV and radio station already existed. So you have Amsterdam, Berlin, London, Bologna. Um, but also Vienna or Ljubljana, um, especially these kind of independent, as I call them, in independent internet providers actually emerged. So in Amsterdam, it was the Digitale Stadt Amsterdam, you had the Internationale Stadt um, Berlin, but of course also Ludmilla and Ljubljana are public netbase in Vienna. Um, and because of these initiatives, as well as a further, or on the one side, there were these initiatives that actually promoted these kind of new technologies and really bringing like a lot of like cultural and artistic people to the internet in many ways, even like really bringing them by the hands to the new kind of technologies. And of course, at the same time, there was a new fall in the prices of um, 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 digital, or that prices fall for, for technologies in, in information and communication. Um, in the fields, so on the one side, of course, primarily the PC, but also internet access became more and more cheap. You could also say that these kind of initiatives actually helped or opened the door also to implement the internet as a mass medium, I would say. And as I said, at that moment, also this kind of new generation of media activism um, was born that was actually challenging everyone to produce their own media in support of their own political struggle. And Felix Stalder, with whom I, I edited a book about this kind of forgotten futures, as we called it, the radical net, uh, radical net cultures of the 90s, um, said in another text, um, quote, rather than simply counterbalancing mass media, these initiatives radicalized media practices in order to appropriate media technologies and to give them a new meaning. So, I think that's an interesting point because that you have had in the 90s a lot this kind of discussion also about um, defining radical media or tactical media. It was not the, about this kind of 80s idea to build up yet again al al alternative medias. So in some way, always as this kind of like little extension of mass media and this kind of counterbalancing something where you have the mass media thing and then we have to like react to these kind of things. What you have in many ways what's happening today, I would say, um, that you still have I don't know, if you take an Anonymous, for example, it's very um, passive and reacting to different kind of things that happen, and then actually they react in some way, but they don't, okay. But they wouldn't like put on the agenda so much as in some way. No? No, it was not a comment to you, it was just a spark comment. Okay, okay. <laughs> 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 Too much sun, I guess. <laughs> 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 Mm. 
And, and in the 90s, I think that's also what Loving, but also others um, called, they, they called it a sovereign media. So actually media that pos position yourself inside of the discourse in contrast to this kind of like alternative media. And I guess that's also what Peter um, mentioned yesterday. There is this kind of like contradiction all the time that I also have. On the one side, they wanted to be tactical in some way, to intervene in the field. Of course, that's like disserto. On the one side, if you have a strategy, you're recuperating or holding in some way a strategic field. But they actually always said their um, practice is only tactical and they like hit and run in some way. On the other side, everybody wanted to build up their own infrastructure. So there were these initiatives like NetBiz and so on, as I said, in independent internet providers. And I think there's a very interesting contradiction, which I can't really solve. But I think it's interesting that maybe when I come later to this kind of post-media thing, I think they hinted already to something else than they actually... Um, self-theorized at that moment or realized in that moment. So yeah, and this there was, as I said, this kind of um, double disengagement that actually then landed in the tactical media thing also as to a rejection of this, what was called the speculative media theory in order to invent new emancipatory forms of media appropriation. Um, and this depart from a classical media theory which posits media as the tool of ideological programming opened up also some kind of new theoretical perspective um, to the effect that it was no longer only about the reflection of media conditions but rather about the co-creation of the conditions. And also in order to distinguish themselves from the academic critique of mass media, um, tactical media theories or theorists considered their practices as digital micropolitics. And I think this is also um, in some way interesting, where I would say there's a, there's a slight difference to, um, let's say, especially the US, but here especially the Californian discourse at that time, which just I, I read in the, in the Galerie, the uh, Wired magazine from 1995, and Kevin Kelly, and all these kind of people we know, where it was always about this cyber, um, 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 cyber libertarian ideas about parallel spaces. So it was this very male idea about machines and we have the information highway and we have this idea about flying around like lonesome eagles as they called it and and and. While in Europe you really had this kind of like scene where they used shitty technology to connect each other in squatted buildings and so on, especially in Amsterdam and Berlin. And the and what's funny in some way is that this idea about this parallel universe or cyberspace the last thing I saw was maybe Second Life, and then it disappeared in some way, while this kind of idea about social connectivity, actually that was the thing that, that then became mass media in some way, with um, so-called Web 2.0 and social media platforms. So on the one side, this kind of radical idea about um, tactical media became the one that was more influential than afterwards, than only this kind of virtual um, parallel space. Um, and of course also, that you may also know, um, of course there was also this kind of pluralistic approach in tactical media and we also had this. Um, one thing that's also in there is that it, that it was not only um, this, this tactic media as a pluralistic approach was not only um, about to challenge the idea of specialization, um, but was indeed seen as a liberating process by uh, tactical media activists in the 90s themselves. So on the one side, for example, you have the Critical Art Ensemble, and this is like the cover of one of the books about tactical media. Um, they said in the, in, in the mid-90s, there was a feeling of relief that those involved in tactical media could be any kind of cultural hybrid. Many felt liberated from having to present themselves to the public as a specialist in order to be experts. And of course here also tactical media is not limited to any kind of like only digital te technology, but also includes all forms of old and new media and even not media and this kind of different things in order to achieve counter hegemonic goals. So what is important in this context is the collective or is in a way also always this collective appropriation of different media formats in order to produce new forms of knowledge. Um, again, the, the critical art ensemble, rather than just doing critical reading and theorizing, tactical media practitioners go on to develop participatory events that demonstrate the critique through an experimental process. 
So tactical media therefore positions itself outside of the traditional institutions, I would say, or they did it in the 90s, especially universities, academic research center, museums, galleries, um, in order also to develop this kind of, as they said, uh, new forms of uh, knowledge, also to challenge like hierarchical structures and to open up this kind of new possibilities beyond the classical uh, institutions. Though I'm not sure if that was true at that time, because you see that um, many things also in Ludmilla, we heard it yesterday, there was already the connection to academic networks. And of course, and I guess here is also like with Soros being very um, um, a prominent figure. I guess in Vienna it was the same, that it was always art money that was taken. So I think this kind of, I guess that's also a self-discourse in many ways to, to, to do this kind of radicalization. And especially a lot of the people who did, who did or who come out of this tactical media movement, are working at universities, I would even say, nowadays. But nonetheless, um, this critical art ensemble's concept of a liberating um, collective arrangement of enunciation, as they called it, may also refer to the work of Felix Gattari, um, who, in the, who in the 80s already nourished the hope that collective forms of articulation could practice, uh, could replace the old pacifying media structures. In accordance with a non-deterministic um, conception of media, he underlines the fact that the spur of change resides in social practices, not in the technological structure itself. Um, quotes by, by Gattari, obviously we cannot expect a miracle from these technologies. It will all depend ultimately on the capacity of groups of people to take hold of them and apply them um, to their appropriate ends. And of course, linked to this question for Gattari was also, he was, as you know, quite active in um, radio activism in Italy, but also in Paris. Um, linked to this question, uh, linked to the statement is also the question of whether and how self-organized networks can preserve their autonomy in some way against cultural um, hegemony. And here it's interesting in some way that a lot of these kind of tactical media initiatives um, have been run over like at the end of the 90s and I think very easily if you see that like in, in Amsterdam it was just an opening up and all of a sudden they were like you know web designers or commercial IPs and this is like in this kind of thing that that's also what Katja Diefenbach with whom I spoke for the book in some way also said that they completely forgot about in this kind of like self discourse about being the radical being the smarter being faster and so on being the media uh, guerreros um, that they actually forgot for the, to the, for the political organization in some way, that the structures, or however we want to, to call it, weren't not so um, important for them. And that actually then um, backfired in some way. And as soon as the market was like ready and the, this kind of discourse was already there, it just got completely run over and disappeared in some way, as a movement, as I said. So yeah. Katja Diefenbach. Um, it's, in the, it's in this book, um, Vergessene Zukunft, The Forgotten Future, there's an interview with her. But it's she has also, right? yeah, that's yeah. Felix and I, the, the book we yeah, co-authored. Yeah, yeah. But there are also many texts, even from the 90s on that time, where she already like criticizes this kind of like, you know... Um, For the lack of a strong political organization, yeah, which yeah. belongs to very strong political Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. No, no, definitely. No, no, that was my... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think she was... But in many... Yeah. But in many ways, she was right that, you know, this kind of, it, it's this awkward discourses when you read also net time of the time that they always thought like, yeah, we are anyway smarter than the others, than the state and the market and so on. And it was completely forgotten that there's something like going on behind them. And they then afterwards got completely overrun in any ways. So, um, So similar to tactical media, I would say that Gattari's intention is also to escape what he calls the postmodern impasse. Um, he's concerned with the possibility of an individual and collective self-position that can serve as a starting point for what he calls this um, post-media era, in which, and that's his quote, the media will be reappropriated by a multitude of subject groups. The pro uh, proliferation of media-based subjectivity before uh, therefore, would not necessarily mean a further step towards the dissolution of the social, that would be like this Baudrillard idea, but could enable a recombination of social practices. And that's also what we discussed in, in some way about the uh, machinic, because social practices, of course, is here also meant or always meant as a social um, 
technical milieu or asso uh, associative milieu. This is why technical media practices, in my opinion, continue to play a crucial role, especially since this kind of strategic illusion vis-a-vis -vis the media is just, according to Gattery, and the most tangible symptom of a deeper crisis. And he wrote, the suggestive power of the theory of information has contributed to masking the importance of the enunciative dimensions of communication. So in that sense, messages are not only transmitted, of course, but rather their meaning depends on the interpretive interpretative framework of each um, recipient. And this is like, again, this idea, it's not only about the individual, it's not only about like the experts behind like the camera, but it's about our interpretation um, and even meaning framework that, that in my ideas, or as I see it, completely changed like with what we have nowadays with ubiquitous media and new kind of technological milieus where technology is anyway surrounding us, uh, us more or less like, like an environment. And I think Gatari already hinted to this kind of point and tactical media also already like had this kind of things in mind um, in their practices. So one of the websites, of course, for these tactical media things would also be the tactical media files, which is nice by Eric, who is, I think, later here by video. Yeah. Um, so in addition to the physical structure um, of the media, environmental, social and mental aspects now move to the center of interest to master current mass media crisis. And in his essay on the legacies of tactical media, Eric Klutenberg, um, refers to this media ecological debate of the 90s that came up through the engagement with um, Gatry's uh, work. In this sense, the massive dissemination of digital networks and internet technologies opened up a new ecological field on which new forms of cooperation and exchange, production and distribution have emerged. And I guess that Vera will also show a little bit in some way um, how this kind of new media practices um, also work in what I would call this post-media era on the example of um, um, China. Just like quickly to come to the end is um, what I think in some way the contradiction against is that actually in tactical media there was already this kind of strategic dimension and strategic direction in some way. And I guess this is also what distinguishes these early net pioneers in some way, if you want to call them like this, from current, especially also resistant media practices, uh, as we said yesterday, Web 2.0 um, media practices, resistant practices, and so on. Because today, digital media technologies have become more prevalent than ever before. And as a consequence, tactical media practices have penetrated almost all aspects um, of everyday life. However, most of the media infrastructure we are using is in the hands, of course, of a few companies. Uh, companies and thus re-establishing the old model of mass media domination. So that's actually what Gattari wanted to get rid of in some way and it's now actually re-articulated in many ways. In other words, um, the decentralization of the means of production was accompanied by a centralization of the relations of production. And due to this paradox, the interest in building up autonomous resources, networks and infrastructures has become more topical than ever today. The point here is not so much, again, to grow up an alternative to conventional mass media, but rather to create one's own media. Um, and as Gattari telegraphed in the early days of the 90s, um, refusing the status of the current media compi uh, combined with the search for new social interactivities, for an institutional creativity and an enrichment of values, would already constitute an important step on the way of remaking social practices. So I would say in some way that today we could also think about maybe reinventing um, but, uh, we should actually consider, of course, also of the experience of the last 20 years, media neither as this kind of external structure in the terms of a manipulation but also emancipation paradigm, nor as pure means in the, in the struggle for political um, objectives but more as this kind of common tools we are all using anyway in order to shape our everyday life. And I guess also that's in some way what we are trying to do in Lüneburg, which is not, the, of course, not a hegemonic media lab, but it's one of the smaller ones, which is, which is in cooperation with Mute, where actually we have now this kind of new research cycle, which is looking directly into this kind of ideas about um, comrade things and alien life. 
And this is actually exactly this idea about how can we see um, technology, not again as some kind of external infrastructure or structure in some way, but as this kind of, of environment we are um, engaging with and acting within anyway. And yeah, I guess also Vera has now some of these kind of examples where I think it's also like a lot of like how to engage in a new kind of aesthetic paradigm in I don't know, something like that would be called post-media era or whatever. Mm -hmm. I try. I think um, what Clemens describes as the um, uh, post-media paradigm, or this going um, into the everyday, that's what, uh, what is, um, I think, pretty well describing the way the internet or digital tools, and especially social media, are getting used in China. Because in the 90s, at the time when, um, or the time that you just introduced, when tactical media started here in the European context, at that time um, in China, I think activism or controversial issues were rather captured in documentary films. So oh. there were kind of also um, more exclusive circles, mostly artists, and they did what um, Frederick Wiseman did in the US, like taking their camera and kind of witnessing or being with a situation for several hours. I think that could be the equivalent, but the analog equivalent. I think they exchanged films on DVDs. And um, as you probably know, there's this big pirate DVD market in China. I mean, already in the 90s, people were um, exchanging files and films um, in that way. So just to... Um, get our heads towards Asia, <laughs> just trying to leave this um, context from just some brief um, note at the beginning. So my approach is rather a journalistic one. And, and when Thomas Love asked me to contribute to this um, conference, um, he suggested that I could look into the way um, or what kind of radical media could actually mean in a Chinese um, context. Um, so even though I hadn't been to China since March 2012, I accepted the invitation because I liked the um, obligation to get myself back into this state of mind and I was also happy of having a reason to catch up what, um, with what happened in the meantime online. Um, so what is the specific Chinese context actually and um, what could be considered radical in China might not be radical elsewhere, which is due to the fact that the um, internet is heavily censored, as you know, from the media. Um, so, but also at this, um, the time, it seemed now uh, very interesting that the English language discourse had reached an interesting point, um, because Western commentators write that the Communist Party actually incorporated the internet in its political setting much better than they had expected. So earlier, it's I think no more than two years ago, um, international press and TV reports were kind of expecting because blogging became so popular in China that it um, had some influence on the democratization movement and that could arise as a result of these online activities. Um, because they thought that digital technologies such as weblogs, podcasts and Skype had not yet been fully exploited. At the same time, American companies such as Microsoft and Cisco cooperated with the Chinese government to combat the discourse of dissent and offer their technologies to provide an effective firewall and control public opinion. So it's always kind of interesting to have these, to think about these two kind of contradictory um, connections or relations. Um, uh, just to clarify, when um, I speak now about the Chinese internet, I speak on the subject 
uh, with a double distance because one is I haven't been there for quite some months and also um, uh, I don't speak the language. I hardly can do some small talk and I cannot read anything online. Um, so my approach depends on translation, either by web services or Chinese friends. So for a few years now, editors, um, which is kind of really nice editors, select news and discussions from Weibo, which is the name of these Chinese microblogs. It's not a brand name, but it's just uh, the Chinese term. There are different companies offering the service. Um, so there are kind of these websites that do these translations. And among the most known ones, I just name three of them. One is called Ministry of Tofu, another one Tea Leaf Nation, and the third one is Shanghaiist. And those have kind of really, um, I think they update mostly every day and they choose the most discussed topics or news or events and translate those into English. They give kind of a summary and quote some uh, comments. Um, um, Rebecca McKinnon, a former CNN Asia journalist and writer, also Global Voices co-founder last year, explained in an interview, if anything, Weibo may even help the Communist, re Communist Party re-centralize its political power at the expense of local officials and regional governments, which over the past three decades of economic reform have gained greater autonomy from Beijing. So she thinks the Weibo companies are all headquartered into the capital and required to take orders from the central government. According to McKinnon, the advent of Weibo has created a cycle in which the public is increasingly emboldened to use social media to report on localized abuses by individual officials. Some scholars argue that the internet has brought a monetary democracy to China because the internet enables citizens to monitor the behavior of officials, particularly local ones, and document abuses. Consequently, one would have to add while being monitored in doing so. McKinnon claims um, she has seen Chinese officials make the case that thanks to Weibo and social media China, and social media, China is already democratizing, so it doesn't need multi-party elections or an independent judiciary. The Economist magazine comments in a recent article, not only has Chinese authoritarian rule survived the internet, but the state has shown great skill in bending the technology to its own purposes, enabling it to exercise better control of its own society and setting an example for other repressive regimes. The Economist concludes, the internet requires the party center to be more efficient at being, at being authoritarian. Just after these two um, voices from the media um, had a look into a book, it's called The Power of the Internet in China, Citizen Activism Online. It's by Guo, Guo Bin Yang, a professor for Asian cultures teaching at Columbia University. And he's, I think, challenging the way to judge on what is happening online. He notes in his concluding chapter, the most important development is citizens' unofficial democracy. Online activism is a microcosm of China's new citizen, at, citizen activism and it is one of its most vibrant currents. In this sense, online activism marks the expansion of grassroots citizen democracy. If one were feeling optimistic, one might say the West with its paradigms and criteria is thinking in terms that entirely miss the point when it comes to cultural production in China. This becomes especially apparent in the context of the program Supergirl, modeled on American idols, in which millions of Chinese took part in the decision by sending text messages, which was interpreted as the first sign of a democratic decision-making process. Um, just this, these few um, voices on democracy in China, and if there's any, if, it, if it's possible to match it anyhow, um, I will come back to that a little later when I introduce Shanjai and um, 
I will come back to that. Now to the very first example. I would like to show um, an excerpt from a documentary film. The title is High Tech Low Life. It's by Stephen Main and it was um, released last year. And in this documentary he follows, it's 83 minutes long, and he follows two, China, uh, two of China's um, citizen reporters as they traveled um, through the country and why they're kind of reporting or recording their stories and social issues. Um, it is also a portrait of two different generations. The one, the younger guy, is um, emphasizing the individual, whereas the older one is motivated by his idea of social justice. Um, in terms of money, because in the morning, or yesterday, it was discussed that Soros founded um, Media Labs in this region. Like those two um, bloggers, the one, the younger one is called Zola, the older one calls himself Tiger Temple. They get mostly paid by the people they report about. So they, if some people have struggled with what they are doing, they use them and their possibilities of making their stories public. And they give them little money to, um, and invite them for a dinner and so it's kind of a very close or kind of, that's also the difference to journalism, that they have this kind of much closer relationship with the people they report about. Also the younger guy, he's selling vegetables to make a living. So there's no foundation or kind of other money involved in what they do. This is a short sequence where he's introducing his equipment. But maybe I go straight to the one where you see a one example of the way he's reporting. I just play this. Oops, sorry. <laughs> The first example, I have three all together, and um, the third one will actually build on this one and the second one. <laughs> 
Um, so it seems impossible to talk about the Chinese internet without getting into censorship. China is among countries like Syria, Jordan and Turkey when it comes to reports on internet censorship, blocking websites, deleting specific content or throttling internet speed. The harshest intervention was around the Bo Lai case. Maybe you um, remember it was the, um, the guy who was um, um, head of government in Chongqing and he had operated his own policies like commercial free television, singing Maoist songs and combating mafia-like structures. And apparently he was entangled in precisely these structures because there was supposed to be a connection between the death of a British entrepreneur and Bo's wife. Um, and the Ministry of Public Security reacted to all the speculations and rumors that kind of were exchanged among those microblog users online and um, they blocked the service for a whole weekend from Friday to Sunday. So that was kind of very disciplinary um, intervention into the blogs. So the site was accessible, but nobody was allowed to post any new messages for three full days. So when it comes to sensitive events or politically relevant dates like that, and also like last week, Wednesday, um, 4th of June, when it was the 24th um, anniversary of the um, Tiananmen Square um, event, or the um, Tiananmen Square massacre, um, users were actually, they were already cynically joking that the June 4th was the internet maintenance day because they could hardly kind of do anything. So at this point I would briefly like to introduce um, several monitoring websites run by different individuals and institutions in Hong Kong, Berkeley or by people who decided to stay anonymous. Um, and they collect censored words and expressions and give advice how to navigate the web without being too much affected by the government's interventions. One of those sites is called um, China Digital Times. They are based in Berkeley, California, and this website is supported by the Counter Power Lab out of the School of Information at the University of California in Berkeley. Those editors are Americans and Chinese Americans, and they, for example, have this spreadsheet. It's a public spreadsheet on Google Docs where they can, you see here, I just um, made the screenshot uh, a day or two days ago, and they have the sensitive words listened, uh, listed. And if you click of those, um, on those links, in the third column, you will get to a page where they kind of briefly explain why this particular term is on the list. And that's constantly um, changing. This is another example. It's called Blocked on Weibo. It's less um, extensive than the previous example. And this is the China Media Project. It's um, run by the Hong Kong University. And they operate as a kind of a a Weibo backup. They say they store the Weibo posts in a database which are getting deleted. And then there's this web service called Weibo Suit. Um, they collaborate with the China Media Project in Hong Kong. And these are three data journalists based in Hong Kong. One Australian guy and one Hong Kong guy who was a former analyst and trader. And But this is still in a beta version. Um, yeah, it's still a beta version. I would like to quickly um, introduce um, François Julien. He's um, a sinologist and he brought up a term um, which he calls the potential of the situation, which I think might be interesting to look at um, with tactical media as we know it from here, because his term, he's, he's got it from martial arts writings, from Chinese texts, and um, it is the ability, it's describing the ability to opt out of the circumstances. So this strategy 
as kind of a tactical approach in a way. Somehow it seems to me that the two terms fall together in one. So the strategist is therefore acting out of the situation, not of a situation that I have previously modeled, but rather of the present situation in which I find myself and within which I try to identify where the potential is and how to exploit it. So this brief mention of Julien is to insinuate the different context which we find um, on the Chinese internet. So strategy with disciplining effect based on tacticality. Um, so with this differentiation one is maybe walking on slippery ground, but not only the users or these online activists use um, tactics, also censors um, kind of have a very tactical approach to censoring the internet. I just name three different kinds, like one is um, um, old results, for example, if people would look up Tiananmen Square incident, then they could uh, maybe find uh, search results, but all were about the Tiananmen Square incident of 1976 and not about this year, and if any people would comment on that. Then there's this tactic of delaying results, so the search for certain search terms might take much longer than just looking up um, a recipe. Um, also fake tactics, um, messages saying sorry, no results can be found. And um, another tactic is to only um, have so-called V users, verified users on microblogs to, to give them their freedom to, do, to write what they do because they tend to follow the rules. That's what's assumed. So Sina's new approach to censorship um, is part of a trend of more subtle filtering of the Chinese internet designed to decrease the awareness of censorship among internet users. For example, researchers have found that when Sina, the company that runs one of the microblogs, censors certain posts on Weibo, they remain visible to the user who posted them, but leaving other, other but leaving users, sorry, unaware that they are being censored. Um, okay, now I'll come to the second um, example. Um, I just play the very beginning so that you can kind of get the um, idea. It's a short video by Hu Ge. It's called CCAV, China Central Adult Video, and that's a parody of CCTV, the state television. Um, and he, the, the, the producer of this video, he anchors a news report on the residents' annual meeting discussing various daily housing issues in a shared apartment that resonates with current social problems in China. So <laughs> Thank you. 
会议决定斥资三百元进行马桶修复、管道疏通等一系列重大项目投资。专家预测，随着这些重大项目的纷纷上马，内需将会源源不断地拉出来 ，GDP 增长将超过十个百分点。为了解决群租房内人员众多而厕所不足的问题，本次会议还做出了一系列重要决定。记者采访时发现，本群租房内人员往来众多，但厕所只有一个，由于僧多粥少。导致马桶的通畅率已经连续十八个月出现负增长，厕所的发展已经远远落后于群众的需求。此外，大便排放量超标问题也严重影响了本群租房的形象。为贯彻落实节能减排要求，保持马桶畅通，会议决定从今天起开始实施厕所管理措施，现就有关事项通告如下：从今天起，本群租房内的房客按身份证号轮流排便，身份证号为单号的。只能在单号日排便，双号日停止排便。身份证号为双号的，只能在双号日排便，单号日停止排便。新的措施实施以后，将有效缓解厕所不足所带来的矛盾。Sorry, I put this on, on silent.、Um, just to briefly、um, explain, it's not the only、um, video, online video work that's picking up the aesthetics or kind of parodying. The Chinese Central Television. There has been also be,、um, a parody version of the national kind of the annual、um, New Year's show. It's like a four or five hours long television show, and there were people kind of producing what they claim to be the younger version of this kind of television show, which is very kind of old-fashioned. The way kind of the little sketches they play, and then there's、uh, military dancing and. Um, and that's part of a larger cultural context, which is called Shanghai. And Shanghai originally it started as an economic、um, technique, and mainly describes the market of creative fake products. I brought one of those fake products. It's、um, an iPhone Air, and that's even a fake where there's no original. To, it's kind of taking up this、um, computer designs from I think the early 2000s. And when there are incoming calls, it, the Apple kind of is blinking. Yeah, I can turn it on. I just you can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there are even more examples. They say on the those、um, mobile phones made in Shenzhen or designed by Apple. There was the iPhone five even before the real iPhone five was on the market. When, when Apple was still selling iPhone 4, and、um, so in this way, people. Yeah, no help.、Right. And the interesting thing is that in 2011 already, the、um, official news agency in China, Xinhua, they already declared in 2011 the post-Shanghai era,、um, because they said the price cut. Of branded cell phones and the public's growing intellectual property protection awareness, I think it's just simply not true because this market is still very much alive.、Um, so they said that that contributed to the decline of Shanghai. But the heaviest blow came from China's determination to enhance IPR, intellectual property rights protection, and develop indigenous innovation. Tang said. So now my question is: Shanghai is that maybe more a form of radical economy?、Um, in the same year, in 2011, there were photos of fake Apple stores also kind of being circulated on the internet. Maybe you came across those. I don't know. So in the south of、um, China, in the city of Kunming, there were kind of streets with kind of at least five to ten Apple stores, one next to the other, and they look very much like.、Um, Kind of the official Apple store with the people, the employees wearing blue shirts and kind of having the same furniture design inside. And just a quick explanation why it is actually possible that those phones get produced in China is because of the、uh, the Chinese Ministry of Industry and Information Technology had abolished the licensing of port. Devices such as mobile phones in October 2007. About this time, the Taiwanese company MediaTek had invented the all-in-one mobile phone chip, 
which led to an extreme reduction of production costs. Small and flexible Shanghai companies began to share the costs of research and development. The specific production of this model is that technology is treated as open source. So even at small numbers, companies made profit. And Byung-Shul Han, who's a um, uh, Korean philosopher based in Germany, he comes along with a broader, more wide-scale definition of the Shanghai concept. So according to Han, Shanghai operates with an intensive formation of hybrids. From his perspective, Maoism was in itself a kind of Shanghai Marxism. Given the lack of workers and industrial proletariat in China, Mao undertook a transformation of the original Marxist doctrine. In its hybrid capabilities, the Chinese communism appropriated turbo capitalism over the past 30 years. So maybe we could even speak of a Shanghai democracy when it comes to the use of the um, internet in China. Now I have a third example. It's, it went online um, last year in autumn. And here there are no English <coughs> subtitles and I cannot do a simultaneous translation but I have kind of some short or some excerpts from, from what she's talking about. So I would play just the very beginning and then start reading the text. Oops, what did I do? Sorry. So this, um, in this video is in particular interesting, I think, because it uh, seems to mix kind of the way, the parody we've just seen before of the um, Sina Chantel um, television, but also Shanghai and video activism, because um, we see an underpaid Chinese migrant worker and she made this viral video in which she mimics an official in China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs while asking for her own unpaid salary. So she's looking directly into the camera and addresses her comrades in China's petition department, demanding for herself and her farm, workers, farm worker brothers aggregate back pay of Renminbi 3.5 million, that's roughly half a million US dollars in connection with a construction project apparently performed for the funeral and interment management office in Hangu, a district in the northeastern city of Tianjin. She says, we have asked repeatedly and not been paid. Unfortunately, she says, the public servants have a close relationship with our boss. The missing 3.5 million renminbi is our hard-earned money. We strongly demand that they, immediately, that they immediately pay us and without preconditions. Then later in the video, a man is playing a reporter from the imaginary wage-seeking news agency. He's standing before a digital banner reading, not paying workers, their wages harms harmony. You know that the previous president had the slogan of a harmonious society. So the reporter asked a number of um, rehearsed questions. Among them, one of the questions is, it's said that the Hangu funeral and interment management office is run like a corrupt family. How would you comment on that? And then she replies, we have no right to interfere in their internal governance. Thanks. Yeah, I would leave it here, I think, with these um, examples. But this one is really interesting because it's kind of parody, but also performance art. And um, yeah, I think one can kind of see that also kind of this online sphere is kind of quoting from one another with the kind of different styles they use. <laughs> <laughs> Who's calling? Yeah.
itself between um, tactical and disorthos sense, not in the common sense of just particle, but in this kind of rhizomatic um, um, gesture that doesn't want to occupy space. And a lot of the statements, not just by critical art ensemble, but by other people, were that actually we should want to occupy like something more permanent. And in part, um, this is something that was also echoed by Indie Media. So Indie Media was invited to participate, and I was on both mailing lists, and they had um, a lot of uh, resistance to the idea because they thought tactical media was this very elitist thing. And um, they were also discussing in terms of their own background. So if you think of the first Indie Media in 99 in Seattle, Seattle, that was a tactic, tactical in sort of sense. But what actually happened after that is that they did want to occupy space and they wanted to set up something like a counter hegemonic practice. Um, so I think there was this kind of critique of an internal um, limitation both of the, of the practice and also of the concept itself as, as not being so, so useful. And um, I think there is a difference between that, for example, with, with indie media and other um, projects that wanted to set up a kind of counter hegemonic strategy and what's actually happening now um, because you have something that isn't counter hegemonic and you have uh, something like Facebook which is being used and Twitter which is being used by activists so in a way they're appropriating it but that wasn't the original intent so in a way they're they're being tactical in respect to the technology itself whereas what any media wanted to do is to set up its own oppositional uh, alternative uh, that could be used in a hit and run sense, but that also would have a stable infrastructure. So I think there's some distinctions that are being made. And I, um, the point that Anna uh, had made earlier about like, the discourse in the 90s being very elitist, and what's happening now that, that ordinary citizens and people who are fishing are using this, it's, it's very interesting, and it is true that it's, it's widespread, but it's also, I, I think, um, in a sense, it's squatting in this uh, very commercialized media, but um, there isn't this ideological, should we do it, uh, do, do we get co-opted? So I think people just use it because it's available and they don't worry about the consequences anymore. And see, as that is the, they don't think necessarily that they're subverting it. It's just, uh, in a sense, by any media necessary. Mm -hmm. No, but, but definitely, I mean, that's the thing like that I think it's always mixed up or it was always mixed up because if you go back into this kind of independent internet providers that was strategic in some way. What I find interesting in a way of a genealogy, if you go back to what Gerald said, like not opposing organization, but looking at the different kind of organizations that you had, like I think in the, I mean, I know the Viennese context, but I would say Central Europe, a lot of these people from these initiatives let's say, net, net pioneers or whatever, came from the 80s, no? Like, a lot of them were trained in this kind of, we have to found an organization and then to go on, and it was, everything was an organization in some way. Well, in the media, there was a long discussion going on, should be, I don't know, Verein, is that organization or? Association. Association, okay. Like, you see that the typically German thing, we have to find an association to do something. Well, um, there was the discussion for in the media for a long time, and actually they, they opposed this kind of, like, question they didn't want to, to get any kind of um, association in, in effect and nowadays it's super interesting that even this kind of idea about the moderator which in the media still had as you also said there were like editorial um, discussions and, 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 and decisions having been made in a very political way you don't even that is not there anymore you don't even need this moderated role in some way <coughs> though I mean if I see this kind of like tra trajectory Though, and that's I find also important to say, it's not only distributed. I mean, it's more in this kind of direction. What um, Nunes, what's his like? Rod uh, Rodrigo calls this distributed leadership. So it's actually uh, uh, distributed leadership. So what you also see is, for example, in Anonymous, but also the Tahrir Square and so on, that people actually take over different kind of groups for, for a temporary situation. Then a decision is like pushed forward, but then it changes again in some way. So it's this dissemination, but at the same time, new manifestations of forming a new kind of 
deterritorialization or organization in some way. And I think that always happened these last 20 years, as you can see in the tactical media thing. But I, I also think it wasn't like an opposition. I think in the 90s it was very strategic in many ways, as today there are many tactical elements as well. And I think the question to ask is like how to combine them. And that was in the end what I meant. I think that this kind of infrastructure is becoming more and more interesting, at least in the discourses I see like Freedom Box Foundation and all these kind of ideas, can we or should we again build up infrastructure? That's something I would be interested in some way. Maybe there's an interesting point that it shows actually has been done by Anna today that in some sense um, the point where she, uh, that she had this line that uh, they had been disappointed that something had been actualized so some demand had been, let's say, at least approved or accepted and taken as uh, as real. So that, that this actualization uh, um, had, um, at least for the revolutionaries among them, and split, that somehow had not met the promise of, let's say, changing the the whole setup, changing the whole, changing cosmos. And in, 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 in some ways, it seems as if also yesterday, and what we are talking today, as if. Um, the actualization uh, that this kind of <coughs> media practice, which is massive, which is global, had in some sense not met the promise, at least it had for the intellectual, at least for the, let's say now, elitist of the tactical media. This is a, you know, it's a kind of a, again, a contradiction, <coughs> which uh, you, would, you would guess that <coughs> this could be welcome, but no, this has actually been really the problem that some the thing had been, let's say, the utopia had had become real, and also then, you know, just come that the that the last conference we organized on this topic was ten years ago, and it was called Saga, Reality Check for Sada Utopias. So 2003, now we are 2013. Somehow that utopia had been realized, but actualized, for for sure, but that actually the promise somehow uh, had not, or actually the expectations and. Uh, this is also, in some sense, coming in maybe to the to the question of uh, not just of somehow this this eschatology is or our expectations are somehow more uh, more complex than we would like uh, to have. So, in a sense, material sense, something has been actualized, but on the other side, still the expectations not. So, this is uh, something which uh, now during the, those two days is uh, somehow is uh, interesting. Is that there is something which is totally here. So, we would like to say, now I just also come to an example we, we, we had now in Croatia for just about <coughs> the last two months, uh, we had first, and this was the first bigger referendum, a public referendum in Croatia held in Dubrovnik, uh, anti-gentrification in, uh, in, in uh, <coughs> fighting uh, the construction of a big, big golf course, about one billion euro investment. And then the referendum failed because of the law um, <coughs> Of, of uh, not met 50 uh, turnout of 50 percent, and then just about a month afterwards, now we have anti-gay, it's a huge anti-gay conservative backlash. With the already with the probably referendum will be uh, will be helping some near future. Actually, the conservatives have taken over the the let's say the direct democracy issues which have been uh, let's say put forward in the last two or three uh, years by free education movement, also by anti gentrification things. This is, for example, something now people <coughs> really becoming in the last month or so also on the left becoming <laughs> somehow worried. That the, that the very tools or also very uh, <coughs> promises they had in, in the grassroots activism and uh, so let's say very much Facebook uh, or other means of communication have been not actualized by them but actually by the, by the other side and uh, we also actually having uh, this kind of things where you <coughs> something, let's say the format or the organizational thing or the technology is being used by many should be, let's say, in the egalitarian sense, it should be okay. But then on the other side, this is ex exactly used by the, let's say, by the other side. Mm. I mean, yeah, that's part of this kind of what the shift would be about the post-mediality. Though it's then going further into kind of like things, then, yeah, when the technology itself actually also plays kind of a political role, but I think like a lot of these kind of tactical things you will also see more in the so-called global south no I, I don't know if, if you can say that some some hopes are still more articulated or 
actualized in some way in these examples when you see migrant workers actually using these technologies which maybe nobody would do in Europe at the moment or in some way mm. I would see but I don't know if this still is kind of like more hope to the towards that internet technology would be a step towards democratization or is it also an illusion already or disillusion I think it's um, mostly about circulating um, certain struggles and making struggles public and then trying to fight for your right but I think from from what I know from what I could tell it's not people are not motivated by this kind of wider by this kind of not looking at a wider horizon but kind of being into this everyday struggle and trying to get there kind of using the internet as making their issues public mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the democracy that's very much brought in from the outside. Question, how, how much is there use of uh, services based outside of China? Uh, do people resort to that? You mean like how many people use VPNs to yeah. get to English language or kind of foreign language websites? Yeah, exactly. Does it make any sense to uh, if you fear that your content will be censored to uh, place it somewhere. Yeah, that's what outside. people also do. Yeah, yeah that Sometimes, I mean, in, in countries where internet is less uh, censored and surveilled, uh, sometimes it makes sense. I'm listening to somebody telling how just before the Arab Spring, I mean, uh, people reporting on, on human rights abuses. Yeah, but they uh, report also mainly for their kind of fellow people and that's yeah, and they yes. want to have them See, to have them as readers and they address them primarily as their audience so it makes much more sense to find a way to publish the content within or kind of on Chinese platforms. Maybe that's an interesting distinction is that like this is kind of this form of address is really like not I don't know if it has that much to do with tactical media in the sense that it, it takes a different kind of approach, which is like this kind of Prelicia, like a kind of address to power, like it's a kind of denunciation to directly to power. And it, like actually really kind of quite like the, the formally how it presents itself as well. But that's like, I, I'm not, do you know, I was wondering if you know what the, well actually maybe that's insignificant, but I was just wondering if that's, you know, what is the address of its tactical media? Is it you know strictly kind of internally about distributing uh, you know information, or does it, it also engage in this kind of address to power? I can think of maybe it doesn't. From most of the examples I can think of, um, it's mostly addressing more uh, local government structures, and there I think there were kind of cases where um, um, corruption was kind of addressed online and then those people kind of had to move, had to leave their office and somebody else came in. So it's more on this, from what I know, on the local level of, of power. Yeah, and if, if, if it's kind of reaching the top level, like with this case of Bo Lai, the head of government in, in one province, then um, they reacted with kind of a three days um, blocking of those so services. Is it, is it like a sense that uh, in Chinese politics, because of the <coughs> Cultural Revolution was not that long ago in the times of people's memory, so there is the expectation that you can like actually denounce officials and produce results, you can actually, you know, like force them into self criticism or kind of at least like say, Comrade, what are you doing? You know, so I don't think that's completely different. You know, I don't, I wouldn't expect that situation in the UK. You know, I don't think I'm, you know, have the opportunity to speak to a politician most of the time. So I don't know if that's it's also a structural difference which changes the kind of form of the use of media take. Mm. But how would this, where's this kind of change? Like, why you think it would work in China, not in the UK? 
Well, I think this is a kind of tradition. It, maybe a tradition stroke. You know, we could say from a, a cynical perspective, we'd say that's completely illusory. You know, mm. We'd be like, oh yeah, you know, people believe workers still believe they can actually talk to the party bosses. But I think you know that it, it can can have can be a powerful conviction and can have some kind of traction on reality there, as far as I'm you know told. But um, I don't think in the kind of way that some sort of neoliberal politics work. It, my experience of so-called consultation, it's it's just like it's just a consultation, and they, they do whatever they want anyway. Yeah. And so it's not there isn't any kind of oh yeah you can get results by you know, invoking this authority somehow. Do I mean like? But I don't, I'm also not sure if this works um, anymore in some way. But if you look at one example, it's quite prominent, of course, would be like Yes Man, for example, in the against Dow Chemicals, which was actually something like in the same direction, you know, entering the kind of media channels and then forcing them, as you said, into a position they didn't want to be in in some way. But I'm, and also these kind of things, also in the net uh, based environment that happened about Nike Ground and so on. But here I'm like, Actually, that would be this, this thing. It's still this kind of artistic practices in a very elitist way, I would say. But I wouldn't be so disillusionized, how would you say? Disillusioned. Disillusioned. Um, because I think actually there's something completely new coming up, which is this kind of, let's say, post-media thing, but this kind of like um, new environments anyway happening in some way where, you know, um, it's more about these common things, like in a media way. We don't need this kind of artistic practices anymore to point at it because it's happening anyway in many ways. And this would be an interesting point. So in some way, I don't even want to maybe um, talk to my government anymore. You know what I mean? It's like, a, it's a, I don't know, it's this, this idea about sovereign media maybe works even better today than it worked in the 90s, where it was still this kind of like idea but only by artistics it wasn't this collective um, appropriation as Kateri talked about i think i see that that today much much more than maybe in the 90s in some way mm. it's actually actualized yeah it's not it's not to kind of i mean yeah it's not to disagree with the whole you know kind of autonomous direction in in autonomous direction in you know kind of western politics which has a relevance to a structural level it's just in a sense this is really both endearing and, and kind of really interesting to mm. see that there is things work differently somewhere else or at least see there's an expectation that things work differently and that actually structures how you use this media. It's like I wouldn't have got a chance to speak to you because there would have been security at your door, but you can do it through this video. You know, it's kind of yeah. <laughs> Anton is playing music. Yeah. 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 Playing music. Yeah, so then I'll sing. Yeah. Yeah, take the chairs uh, out for the last session. Thank you once again, uh, and uh, I'll test the sound system here. Yeah, and then, then we'll go on in about 15 minutes. Yeah. Mm -hmm.